Welcome to Witchlet, a podcast where we talk about the craft of writing and writing the craft. I'm your host, Victoria Rashke, fiction author, witch, and nosy Scorpio. Penny Billington is an active member of the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids and has edited the Order's magazine, Touchstone, for 19 years. She regularly facilitates workshops in the UK and Europe, organizes rituals, gives lectures, and runs a Druid Grove. She is also a frequent guest on the Order's Facebook group, hosting events called Tea with a Druid and the Private Magicians Club. She lives on the Green Somerset Levels near Glastonbury, England. Penny Billington, welcome to Witchlet. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. I am so excited to have you here. I so enjoyed your book and I'm looking forward to talking to you about this. Um, So our traditional first question for everyone is why write? Well, I think we all have the urge to communicate and it just takes different forms. Some people might dance or sing or whatever, but some of us have to write. We just want to get our ideas down on paper and share them that way. And since I was a, when I was a little person, I made my own comic books of uh, television series and things that I saw as where, well, you know, just playing at making stories. I've always loved it. And I like writing fiction and nonfiction. And I especially like the discipline of writing really short stories but that have a beginning, middle and end, because that's the difficult bit. Having an incident or something anecdotal is easy, but to get a satisfying beginning, middle and end, good story arc. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, My husband's favourite micro story is the um, incident of Samara. Do you know that one? Mm -hmm. Uh, No, I don't think so. It's um, a man... um, is told that he will die that day. Oh, and yes, tell it. Yes, he's he's told he will die that day, and he's in the market, and he sees the face of death. So he finds the fastest horse in the city and runs to Samara to get away from death. Mm-hmm. And the man's boss, his employer, I can't remember how he's dressed in the story, but sees death, and he said, why did you frighten you know, my employee. So, and he said, well, I was surprised to see him in the market. I have an appointment with him in Samara this evening. And it's just like, is the perfect little story. <laughs> it's wonderful. And it's a teaching story, isn't it? You can tell it mm-hmm. comes from, you know, it's a bit mystical. It's like our native fairy tales and myths and legends and things. They, they've all got a lesson for us. Mm-hmm. That is a particularly nice one. Yeah. And, and it does have that beginning, middle and end so perfectly mm. encapsulated, like you said. Yeah. So if you talked a little bit about writing since you were young. So what was your journey into writing and publishing? Well, I take after my father in that you never, never do anything that can be put off until tomorrow. You know, so for years and years, I just thought, thought a good writer and thought a good story. Um, But I've been editing this Druid magazine for many years now, and I've done a lot of reviewing and a lot of reading other people's books and self-publishing became much easier. And I thought, actually, there comes a time when you feel you've got enough inside you that it's actually got to come out. And mine came out with a my first Druid detective novel, um, which was a way of trying to sort of put occult truths and ways of living your life, druid ways of living your life in a cracking good story. So I thought, right, I'll try doing that. The other thing was my dad had always maintained that I was a writer and I didn't want him to die before I got a book published, you know? So I thought I gave myself a deadline and I said, by December, I'll put a book in my parents' hands. So I self-published it. And because I got opportunities to write And because uh, uh, to talk and because I got opportunities to talk, I met other people. And so and that's how I got my publisher. That's how I got a mainstream publisher, Mm -hmm. because I was uh, instead of being one of the audience, I became someone who was who was talking on the platform and meeting other authors. And one day, um, Alan Richardson, actually, who some good 
magical author emailed me and said, Llewellyn are looking for another druid in their stable. I'd send them a line straight away. So I did. And uh, that was the beginning of my proper published career. But Lovely. without the self-publishing, I would never, ever have had it. So if anyone has an idea, I would say give yourself a deadline and just see where having that book in your hand leads you. Mm-hmm. It's a fantastic thing to do. Uh, how did if you... it leads nowhere else, the sense of achievement is just brilliant. No, that is that is true. So did you find the self-publishing versus publishing with a publish? How, like, what was that experience like? moving from publishing your own books to then working with a publisher? Oh, working with a publisher is brilliant because um, you don't, it's, it's a, you're a bit of a mug if you don't get someone to edit your book, someone to, to read, to read it and this sort of thing. And of course, a publisher sets all that up for you. You don't have to call on friends for favors or anything. And the other thing about self-publishing, which I didn't realize is that it's a two-stage process. So writing the book is actually quite a small, a third of it, and getting the book published is two thirds, get you know, mm-hmm. uh, and you do all the donkey work yourself, and then of course it's still got typos and things in, because you've done it yourself in a rather amateur amateurish way. <laughs> um, whereas with the publisher, they smooth all that out for you, and they sell it for you afterwards. So it's wonderful. Yeah, I like publishers. <laughs> I think that the marketing part is definitely. Like, you know, in the self-publishing realm, it's like that writing it is small part, getting it out in the world is small part. The marketing seems to be like where the like disconnect, I think for a lot of people who are creative, like that's a whole different kind of creativity marketing and, you know, having someone who can take that part for you is pretty nice. (laughs) Yeah. But also there's this thing of having a niche. I I read a book by Vernon, someone, how to self-publish your book many years ago. And the one thing he said was, find your niche market. You know, so if your passion is yachting, you will be in a yachting club. And, you know, or if it's cats, then you'll be with a cat charity. You've got to have a market for your book to even if you um, sell it for that charity and don't get any money, the money isn't the thing. It's the communicating what you've done, I think. So, of course, with editing a Druid magazine, I knew at the very least I could put a review of my book in the magazine and people would hear people who knew me would hear about it. So mm-hmm. that was a good start for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, Llewellyn is, you know, one of the big names in this particular niche market that we all kind of find ourselves in. Yeah. And we've got uh, American and English things. So I write corn. And they write back and say, what do you mean by corn? And I mean wheat, of course, but corn in America is something completely different. You know, there are all these little stylistic things and mm-hmm. uh, it's it's fun. It's great fun. Yeah. Um, I also wrote a book called um, The Wisdom of Birch, uh, You and Oak. And then I found out that you don't have big U's as we do in, in Europe. No. I use U's are 5,000 years old, you know. They meet that, and everyone knows about them in America, of course, completely different. Mm -hmm. So I had to write to 25 American druids and ask their advice, say, hey, I'm in a mess with my book. What shall I do? You know, fortunately, I've got that support network with being involved in a in a druid order. And and presumably, you know, witches have their covens and and uh, heathens have, uh, you know, Norse gatherings and things that can support them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have to admit, as a child, I thought we had yew trees in the United States because I read so much British fiction that yes. I didn't know until I was an adult, fully an adult, that we did not have yew trees generally in the yeah. United States. So, well, if you if you come to Britain, then I'll take you in the car five miles away. There's one you can sit inside. You know, uh, they are just yes. enormous, and it's their habit to completely disintegrate in the middle. Mm-hmm. and keep a shell and that's how they keep alive for thousands of years they never get blown over by the wind they never top heavy you know they just have this shell and then mm-hmm. eventually the uh they dip down and they will root where the branches dip oh, so yeah where you get a grove of yew trees in the middle there's often a very old trunk the, the mother of them all mm-hmm. exciting stuff but that you have very- just 
your trees are just as beautiful in, in yeah. America and have their yes. own qualities. I am um, very close to the coast in California. So uh, we have a lot of redwoods close to us and they are oh. truly remarkable beings. <laughs> they are iconic and ancient trees, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you edit the magazine. Now you're publishing this book. Um, is writing most of your time or do you still do a lot of other things to kind of support your writing? Um, well, I'm, uh, I don't work anymore because I'm past the age where I have to. So that's absolutely brilliant. Um, so what I would tend to do is get up and fiddle around a bit and not go on Facebook or anything like that. If I want to get any work writing done, just don't do anything else. In fact, sometimes I read this. I don't know if have you heard of Mills and Boone? It's a very famous romantic uh, publisher, they get out hundreds of titles per year, mm -hmm. you know, and they're all the same, you know, boy meets girl and <laughs> they fall out, they fall in love, they fall out again, there are misunderstandings, and, you know, eventually they kiss on the last page. But um, I read one of their most prolific authors and she said she sits in bed and writes. And I thought that's a good idea. So if I've got serious writing to do, I'll get up get washed, get a cup of tea, and then just sit in bed, shut the bedroom door and not do anything till I've done what makes me feel happy, you know, mm -hmm. comfortable and, and uh, I've, yeah, satisfied with what I've done that day. But, uh, and then also I live near a beautiful park, you would say. So I regularly take a coffee up there and sit under ancient trees. That's part of my writing day as well, mm -hmm. just to have that sort of moodling time where you just let your brain go into into gear out out of gear and just see what you pick up from the ether um, that uh, so those like, two things really mm, that sounds lovely both of both of those sound lovely and i think my cat would let me stay in bed and write those sadly <laughs> <laughs> i don't think he'd be up for that yeah. but well, you should you should lay off the Egyptian magic, you know, if you if you're a slave to your cat. <laughs> we druids don't have that problem. I don't have a cat. Uh, yeah, cat, and cats have their own their own way of ruling the roost in the house. Um, yeah. So obviously, you write under these trees. So what was the seed for Nine Ways to Charm a Druid? How did you decide this was the book you wanted to write? Um. Well, where, where where do you look for, for where do you look for your inspiration? That's that's the huge question, isn't it? Because so many people out there will want to write a book and not quite have the right idea, um, or not quite know how to get an idea. And I know when I was a little girl writing stories, they're all incredibly derivative because I hadn't got any original ideas. So, but if you put yourself in the way of inspiration, that is, if you do whatever your habit is, sit in your magical circle, sit under the trees, um, allow space and time, sort of make the appointment with inspiration, then it doesn't happen when you're, when you're meditating or when you're doing that, but out of the blue sometime an idea will come and you have to write it down straight away so you don't forget it. So the book I wrote about the birch oak and yew, which are the three seminal trees of druidry, came from an idea when I was really tired. I suddenly thought, it's too tiring being human. What would it like to be actually be a tree? Not sit by one, not chat to one, just imagine that I am one. And from that came that book. And with this Dryad book, when you get a book idea, there's a feeling that it's not coming out of your brain necessarily, but that it's in the ether somewhere and someone's going to snatch it and take it and it's going to be theirs. And you have to be open to it to, to catch that idea. So I think there are ideas for, for different um, books all over the place. It just depends which one you catch. But if people are looking for inspiration, I would say, ask those questions. What if all the time? Oh, what if the sky turned pink? What if uh, a, a, a fox spoke to me? What if, what if, what if? Um, in your case, what have I turned around and, and jolly well told my cat what I thought of him jumping on my bed? 
And what if you answer back, you know, and what if and what and these what ifs can take you a long, long way. Because what I do when I get an idea like how to charm a dryad, I love the idea of charming things because there ain't, ain't much charm left in the world, I think. The world is getting coarser and more rough and not as pleasant or civilised. And charming means being charming, but also uh, charming as in having a magical spell. By being charming, we want to charm our dryad and we want to be charmed by that dryad to enter in a, into a mutual story, um, as druids say, for the good of all beings. Mm -hmm. So once I got that idea about being charming, I then thought, well, actually, what publishers are like at the moment is numbers on book titles. Have you seen this? It's always 10 ways to do this, three ways to do that, yes. eight whatevers, and nine is a very druidic number. Nine is three threes. And uh, so that lent itself to nine chapters, different ways to charm. Then the process becomes uh, mind mapping. So mm -hmm. put your title in a big circle, write down nine sp spikes with other circles and just see what, what emerges on a huge piece of paper. And I know some of my friends use uh, post-it notes as well and stick things all over. But once you've got that form settled down, you can begin to write with confidence and you begin, you can begin to use your meditative moodling, hey, anything goes time, because you're within a nice, safe structure. Mm -hmm. I do know people that just um, start writing and don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how many of them finish their books, but the I don't know if you've heard, there's a series called Lovejoy in England mm -hmm. about an antique dealer, and very famous because it became a TV series. Mm -hmm. And I went to a lecture by this guy, and that's how he, he started writing them to make money when he was a junior doctor, and he just started in the middle, whatever his idea was, and didn't know where, where the story started or where it was going. And I think sometimes you can tell. <laughs> yeah. But then, but, but the interesting thing is when you plan out your book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, especially with fiction, you, the story will take over mm -hmm. and might go in a different direction. With nonfiction, you're onto a much, you've got a much clearer idea of what you want to say. But with fiction, have you found this? your characters just say, no, I'm doing this instead. <laughs> yes. I, for, I started very much, um, I guess what people call pantser. I prefer the term discovery writer because I find it's a little more charming than pantser, mm -hmm. as you said. Um, and then as I've gotten along in my writing, I now have kind of what I always call the spine of the story. I know that. And then I fill out all the flesh of it, but sometimes the spine changes too occasionally yeah. when the characters tell you what they want to happen next so yeah but having that spine allows you gives you the confidence to to deviate from it doesn't mm -hmm. it it's like being a teacher if you've got a lesson plan you can go anywhere you want and hopefully you'll come back to where you wanted to be of course mm -hmm. with a fiction writer you don't have to you're not teaching kids you can go and just end up with something completely different if you want but just yeah. as successful I can't, yeah. like you said, though, I can't imagine doing that with, with nonfiction. Like, it makes sense to me just coming out of academic writing to have a plan yeah. and outline and what you're going to, what you want to say and how to get there. That makes way more sense to me. Oh, I think you have to, don't you, for, for clarity and all this. Uh, I mean, the one time when I co-wrote um, The Keys to the Temple with my uh, friend and mentor, Ian Reese, we didn't do it that way we we met every week and we chatted and he had his part because he's a Kabbalah expert and I had my part because I'm a Dion Fortune enthusiast and aficionado uh, and my husband read the book and said what the hell is all this about you know and it's a non-fiction <laughs> book <laughs> and and then he read it again and he said you know what you've done you you've you've done it as if you're workshopping with people and of course we've been workshopping with each other mm -hmm. he said you want to take the whole of section b 
shove it at the back, start with section A and explain what you're doing, you know. But that's the only time I've met, I've done this in that way because it's the only time I've collaborated. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, a, a structure, mind mapping and uh, just, well, there are a million templates out there if people want to do it. Mm-hmm. Fiction is a pain because you have to get all your, uh, sorry, non-fiction is a pain because you have to get all your facts right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, you yes. know, that's a responsibility with fiction. You can, you needn't worry about that quite so much. Right. Did you have to do much research for this book? It seems very much to come out of like a personal experience practice, but I mean, there are footnotes yeah. throughout. So I assume there was some research as well too. Oh yes. Well, there, there was research, but I mean, you, you write out of what you know, basically. So of course mm. I had to look up everything to make sure it was right, but they are my, particularly my associations, and mm-hmm. uh, especially when I'm dealing with an ancient place like Arcadia, where Pan rules and where uh, lots of mythic creatures live and that sort of thing. One of the chapters is called Passport to Arcadia, um, where, of course, you can talk to dryads at, at will. Um, but I had to get it right, you know. I, I my husband's a classical scholar, but I definitely am not. So I had to check everything. Um, well, I had to check it with him as well, out of courtesy, because he's good at this stuff, as well as with the internet. Um, but everything is obviously your personal vision, isn't it? And, and your particular take. And at the beginning, I said, when you feel full enough of ideas, um, you you write... And I think what I mean is when you've been on your path, whether it's Wiccan or Norse or heathen or Druid or shamanic or anything, you take in loads of stuff from teachers and courses and things, but it has to settle down inside you and it it has to become your own in some way. So you're not just regurgitating other people. And when you feel full of your own practice and you feel it's mature, then that's when you feel comfortable doing it. Not, oh, I'm taking this bit from Starhawk and I'm taking this bit from someone else and this bit from someone else, you know, Um, which is, you know, plagiarising and no good at all because they wrote it first and they wrote it best. Um, So after many years of thinking, oh, I wish I could be very strewed authors, I thought, no, I think I really want my own ideas out there now. Yeah, well, I... The book feels very, I mean, I know I have an advanced copy, so there are probably some small changes coming, but, um, but it feels so complete. Like it just feels like such a journey. It was funny. You mentioned romance writing earlier because it is like a romance with none of those dark moments. There's no misunderstandings. (laughs) It is very much (laughs) a romance in in that kind of trajectory, but, um, it just, it, it seems to just naturally have this flow and progression to it from, you know, this, you know, idea that you have to meet a dryad and what would that be like to this, like really that relationship culminating in this kind of connection to everything. Um, But I, I, now I can kind of envision this mind map that you must've had Yeah. now that you've said that, how that all kind of flowed together. Yeah. But really it's all my, I mean, I'm a working druid and it's all my living practice Mm. in, in, you know, one way of presenting my living practice. And, you know, with this relationship we have with the sentient world that's non-human, you know, the only dark times you can have, I think, are forgetting it, forgetting to do it, you know. Mm. And I'm sure anyone listening will know that they've had far more intentions of doing ritual, connecting, you know, making an interface to the divine, doing their spells, do it. You know, we have far more intentions than we ever succeed with because we work all day and we get tired at night and it's we put our feet up or get a takeaway or watch telly. These are all lovely things to do and I like them all, but we have to make the appointment. We have to make time for our spiritual life. If we want anything to change in our apparent world, there is a direct correlation, I think. Um, Do you find over the course of writing the book that your practice changed or evolved in any way just from the the work of the book itself? Yeah, I got to know. I mean, I 
the the trees, the local trees that book is dedicated to, I, I've always known them um, and said hello in passing and had a little bit of a relationship with them, but it got much deeper and I did much more visiting at all hours of the day and night and just checking in with them really. So that in a way that that, yes, it deepened that relationship and that relationship remains as deep now, which is all to the good because we're all so human centric. And I think we put immense pressure on each other because we live so close. I like the Victorian idea, you know, where the man has his study and the lady has her withdrawing room and you knock on the door if you want to, uh, if you want to say, oh, hello, Mr. So-and-so. I thought we'd te take tea together, but that's not going to happen in the real world. We live on top of each other. Um, and uh, to have friends in the non-human world gives you a much wider sense of perspective and of spirit and what we're here to do, I think. The people, I don't know what the COVID regulations have been like over there, but we've had complete lockdowns where people have been shut up in flats with families with no access to a green space or anything. And I'm amazed that more people haven't murdered each other. I mean, and that's quite serious. It's just yes. an appalling situation. We really need to get into nature for our perspective, I think. Mm -hmm. Have a huge, okay. great row in your family and go out and stomp around the park mm -hmm. and just grumble about how awful everyone is. And within five <laughs> minutes, you're thinking, mm, but maybe I was a bit awful as well. And your perspective is changing, you know, yeah. twice around the park and you feel so much better. <laughs> yeah. I was actually reading an article yesterday about um, Diana Beresford Croker, the Canadian, well, I guess Irish Canadian woman. I don't know mm -hmm. if you know about her and just the the kind of conversation of, around her work and um, people accepting that forest bathing is actually a thing and like that there's scientific evidence behind that. And like, I can't imagine, yeah. I mean, I live in an apartment and have had a little like COVID induced agoraphobia, but I've had access yeah. to green space as well. And I can't mm -hmm. imagine being in that um like you said, like on top of people, a whole family and having no access to any kind of interaction with nature, even if it's just a tree in the sidewalk. So, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it as well, how reluctant people are to take on board things like forest bathing has been scientifically proved to be good, you know, um, and uh, there's somewhere in the, uh, somewhere in the Scandinavian countries and they, they had people meditating with trees in winter so there were no leaves it was all dead branches mm -hmm. and even so it, it improved their their mm -hmm. mental state just anything it doesn't have to be green and lush mm -hmm. and pretty and smell nice just anything to anything that takes you out of your head away from mm -hmm. a compu computer screen and out mm -hmm. it's got to be very good and in kind of in light of that one of the things i really loved about the book is the inclusion of people who, you know, for health reasons or mobility reasons could not have access to walk in mm. a forest or, you know, to be physically in that place. And I thought that was such a lovely inclusion, especially around what we've all been through the last two years to have this yeah. way to say, no, you can still do this. There are ways to still have these interactions with dryads, with trees, with you know, then the nature around us that is us. I particularly wanted to do that because I've never seen it written about before. And we're all becoming more aware of disability, disabilities and hidden disabilities as well. Um, and um, and I belong to OBOD, the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. I've been there 30 years. So I've seen everyone getting older and some people getting much more infirm, you know, uh, and they there are, <clears throat> there are people who can't join our ceremonies because they're 93 and they can't walk across two fields anymore, mm -hmm. you know, so we make an accommodation for them. But we but we also do the thing that involves walking across the fields. Um, uh, I always remember someone saying we congratulate people who come to our big Druid gatherings because they've they've come 100 miles or they've they've come a long way. So, but for some of us, just getting up the steps into the hall is like climbing Everest. Mm 
and that's never acknowledged, you know. And I, I just felt so sad to think, you know, these people just struggle away doing the best they can, and they really deserve some time and attention, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's it's such, I love the simplicity of it. You know, if you have someone who can collect something for you, like to have a twig or or something and just a place that, you know, images of those places, like you said, like in Sweden, it was bare trees. I mean, they were real trees, but, you know, yeah. to have an, even to have an image of that can help put your mind in that place. And um, it's just, you know, simple things that when you only see the barrier, it may be difficult to imagine that that's a way to access it. So. Yeah. I don't know whether you um, wear robes or anything like this, but I'm because I'm very into anything that can help you to change your mindset mm-hmm. and make it easy for you. Meditation, things, they're meant to be easy, these things. They're not meant to be a great big struggle. And uh that's why I put, you know, if you just have a green shawl, when you put on your green shawl, mm-hmm. you're being a druid then, you know, you're actively saying to the natural world, hello, I can't get out of my house, but I'm here. Mm-hmm. I'm here. Where are you? Sort of thing. All those, all those little things, just having special things that that change your, change your mindset. There is a reason why a priest puts on priestly robes before he goes into a church. You know, every major religion, they do this. Um, Druids do it, witches do it. You know, Mm -hmm. we don't just throw this stuff on while we chat about the latest television program. It's a thoughtful thing that takes us, starts to take us into a space that's a bit more expansive, a bit more connected um, and just allows our spirit to stretch a little bit more. So, yeah. I know kind of on that, when you and I were emailing back and forth, we talked about, um, and I think this plays into that a little bit, but the difference between doing magic and being magic. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? I'm very interested in this because um, I've got the little book out called How to Stop the Rain, Conversational Magic with the Cosmos. And I, although I've got to publish, I self-published this one because it's tiny, it's a booklet, and it was based on one thing. And the one thing was I went to a pagan conference and I finished speaking and the heavens opened and you couldn't hear people speak. The noise on the marquee roof was so noise of the rain drumming. Mm -hmm. So I said, like the like the best musical films, I said, hey, kids, let's do the show right here. We're all magicians. Why don't we do some magic to stop the rain? And uh, anyway, about 40 people wanted to. Half of them didn't, which was interesting. For 40 people wanted to, so we did it, and I go through the process in the book. And as has happened twice before now with rain, it stopped within five minutes of the rit- of the end of the ritual. It just did. And as usual, what happened was that everyone just walked out the marquee and got on with their lives. And no one except me thought, hey, did we do anything? It, what is this all about? I don't think people are very comfortable with doing magic. I think they worry about the ethics. They worry about the responsibility. Um, And it's right. You know, it just shows what nice people they are. But I think what people want instead of doing magic, I think they want to feel magical. They want to feel they've got a life of enchantment, that enchantment is accessible to them which is a totally different thing to getting a book on spellcraft and saying I've got three in the morning I'll set the alarm I've got to do this I've got to do that you know a b c d which is someone else's recipe and like making bread you know you should have your own recipe not slavishly follow someone else's so I think most people rather than going through those spell recipes they would rather find a way of getting a magical mindset so they feel a magical person. And if anyone does and doesn't want to buy all my books, which are all fantastic, then what they all they've got to do instead is just stop regularly, often enough and long enough to practice gratitude. Because gratitude is the most magical thing in the universe. Um, and once you start doing that and start looking and recognizing uh, if once you're grateful to the sun then you say hello thank you to the sun then you've got a relationship with the sun once you start saying hello to the grass the trees whatever 
there's the beginning of a story with the whole sentient world. And, um, and when it comes to doing magic and having the world respond to you or, or seeming as if it does, it's like trying to borrow a 50 pound note. I mean, I really like you, Victoria. We've met two minutes ago. And if I said, could you PayPal me 50 quid? You know, I'm a bit hard up at the moment. You'll probably say, well, I don't think that's what we do because we have no relationship of that sort of thing. But if we, if I live next door to you, we exchange favors. I, I, I used to, you know, every time you go away, I look after your cat, this sort of thing. You build up this relationship of interaction and you probably would lend each other money if I don't know. But doing magic is just like that. If you have a relationship with the world and you have to crawl through a holly, holly hedge because you've locked yourself out the house, which I did years ago, then you can chat to the holly and say, guess what? I'm going to get in your way in a minute because I've got to find a way through. And if you're lucky, you come through without a scratch. If you're ungrateful, you chop chop your hazel your hazel or your hawthorn wand, and what do you do? You cut yourself, or the branch flips back in your face, just to give you a quick slap and say, "Be more grateful next time. Ask first. Who knows? It's a different and subjective reality. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's sort of it's a scientific thing. I'm not saying it's not a huge paradox, but I am saying if you try it often enough, you'll find it works and kindness and love and fellow feeling will start to flow between you and the universe and you and your tribe, of course. And it, it, I, I'm just kind of mulling this in my brain and this idea that, um, you know, the enchantment hasn't left the world. We just kind of forgot about it. It's kind of been my thought process for a number of years. And this very much touches on that, on this idea that we just have to recognize that the enchantment is still there. We've just blocked it out yeah. from when we were like all of that we felt as children is still there. I think that little bit of us just goes to sleep mm -hmm. and the whole thing is it's dormant. Now we have to wake it up and then it snoozes again. And we have to keep just little and often keep waking mm -hmm. it up, keep drinking out of your tree mug, keep, you know, just, Every time you get up in the morning, look out the window. Don't go straight down and say, look out the window and say hello to whatever's out there. Mm -hmm. Notice, start noticing it. And gradually we wake up this dormant bit of ourselves and it gradually gets more confident. And then what happens is that seamlessly the everyday mundane self and the bit that recognises enchantment and magic sort of fit together. Mm -hmm. So when you're driving the car, you're in the right headspace. When you're walking in the woods, you're in the right headspace, you know, and uh, you just switch automatically. It's, uh, yeah, it's a great journey. It's, it's a journey that doesn't take you away from life. It adds another dimension to life. I'm sure you found that with your magical things. Yes. And it just makes life richer. Mm -hmm. Yes, that I think it like you said, it does add another layer and um the colors are a little brighter. That's kind of the way I think about it too. Everything's yeah. just a little brighter. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we are a podcast, so obviously people cannot see this beautiful what I think is a screen behind you with all these oh, lovely, yeah. beautiful pictures of trees. Can you describe that? Because I, I just wish people could see it because it's such a beautiful backdrop. Well, when you're a druid, people send you calendars each year with beautiful natural images and you end up with about three calendars. And then I've um, I run an online course called Crafting the Druid Path, which you can get to through my website. And I, I thought, well, I've got to I can't have my kitchen sink behind me when <laughs> when I'm talking to people. So we've got this screen. The screen is in four. Um, there are four rows of three anyway, uh, pictures just the right size to cut up a large wall calendar. And so I've got spring, summer, summer autumn and winter behind me on uh, on dark blue, a dark blue background. And it means I've always got the natural world behind me. And I've also got a, a visual aid. Whatever I'm talking about, I can I can point to the relevant mm. picture. 
Yeah. But it's, it's really uh, beautiful. And, and like, or for listeners, Penny is looking at my empty office behind me. It's <laughs> so not nearly as attractive a background in an apartment, no less with white walls. So um, that's a beautiful idea. Um, so you mentioned that people can get to your courses through your website. Are there yeah. other ways that people can get in touch with you? And what, what other things would they find, need to find out about you? Well, if they go to the website, which is just pennybillington.com, then they get one of those things flashing up saying, do you want to um, join my mailing list? And I, I send that out regularly, at least eight times a year, with ideas for simple ceremonies to key into the seasons. So if you're completely isolated, don't have a, a, a coven or a grove or a whatever, or don't have sympathetic neighbours, so you've got to be discreet, or have young children, um, so you want to do something family orientated. Uh, I put in loads of suggestions for ways of celebrating the season eight times a year, and also again my own my own take on things, which mm-hmm. tends to be uh, myth and legend led, especially by the um, Welsh myths of the, the Mabinogion, mm-hmm. which are my great passion, really. They were the first, my first book on Druidry. I um, I think I was the first person to put in print uh, lessons from the Mabinogion. Sorry, I'm going a bit off your, off your question here. Oh, no, 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 no. But I, I was very proud of this because you get, you get a story and you get um, a princess and a horse and a prince and a this and a that, and you read it. It's part of our national repository of treasures, you know. But what has he got to do with our lives? So I looked through these stories and thought, well, actually, that's a lesson for life. That's a lesson for life. That's a lesson for life. Because the one thing the bards did, the ancient Druid bards did, was that they would tell stories that would encourage right behaviour. And they would also uh, rate, they would also tell satires. Um, so um, we think of satires making fun of our politicians. Well, in the Iron Age in Britain, they used to make fun of their kings. If their king didn't behave well, they said they could they could be so rude about him in a satire, it would raise a boil on his nose. You know, he'd be so affronted, it would actually have a magical effect. They were so worried about this in Ireland that I think there was a, a special um, prohibition that bards had to stop making satire. So obviously all these old stories meant something to the people who originally heard them. And so I went through them, and especially with the fourth branch of the Mabinogion, it's it can be read as quite a soap opera of a dysfunctional family, or it can be read as um, stuck energy that has to move forward and change, and you know the in order to um, be in tune with the constant changes of nature. So, but, you know, that was fun for me trying to disentangle all that and get all those lessons out mm-hmm. um so anyway um whatever we were talking about before i got diverted onto that um i i run an online course which you can access from from the website um i run a, a a mailing list and um i speak regularly on various things mm-hmm. and i love being invited by people like you to talk about my work because it's an absolute joy to feel, um, you know, it's all this stuff is worthwhile. And the more everyone shares, the more we all get out of it. Mm-hmm. Yes, very much so. I mean, that was so, one of my... I'm open for speaking engagements. That's it's what no, I to And people can get in touch with you through your website for that purpose, exactly. So yeah. I sent you this, so you know, we do a last question that's a little bit of a game of chance. <laughs> and oh, yes. I will ask you uh, one of my nosy Scorpio questions, which is mm-hmm. about death, sex, religion, politics, or money. And I'll roll a die. And if I roll a number, you'll get one of those. But if I roll a six, you get to pick which one you'd like. Oh. So let's see what the die says. Three, religion, which is interesting because that's kind of what we've been talking about in a roundabout way. Um, <laughs> um, if there were a canon of sainted writers, who would be your patron saint? Okay. Well, my patron saint must be Dion Fortune because I wrote a book about her because she 
had a profound influence on me. Now the, but but she wouldn't be by herself. And I would say the sainted authors would be those who caused me to have a paradigm shift. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes you read a book and your life looks different after it. Yes. Um, and John Michel wrote View Over Atlantis, changed the way I looked at the landscape, changed the idea of archaeology for me. Um, Mary Stewart wrote um, the Merlin trilogy. And the, that way of writing about Merlin and Arthur, it's been done for, for 20, 30 years now. But, God, it was new when it came out in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Wow, I'd never read anything like it. Dion Fortune's books um, were, someone found them in the post office when I was about 20 and bought me some books on her uh, fiction books on magic, that is the Goatfoot God, Moon Magic, the Winged Bull, the Sea Priestess. And she wrote them deliberately, she said, to be an initiatory experience if the reader was ready for that. And I think I must have been ready for that because <laughs> life life was never the same afterwards. Right. Because I didn't have a teacher, I didn't have access to ritual magic or a cavern or a druid grove or anything, but I knew my feet were set on a path. I just knew it. So Dion Fortune for that reason, because I can read the fiction and it still has that initiatory quality about it. But also she wrote a load of nonfiction mm-hmm. and it is practical and down to earth and commonsensical and ethical and tells you everything you need to know. Um, if you want to avoid the pitfalls of modern thing, you know, the ideas of coercive magic and, uh, you know, getting stuck with people you shouldn't be doing magic with and all that sort of thing. But she has tremendously steady and straightforward and ethical guidelines. And then she wrote a book called The Mystical Kabbalah, um, which explains the tree of life, the Kabbalistic mm-hmm. tree of life from the Western magical tradition perspective. Um, and that's what the fiction and the ma- uh, Mystical Kabbalah, what we combine in our book about Dion Fortune. Mm-hmm. But in England, we have a thing called um, a radio program called Desert Island Discs. And famous people choose seven discs to take to an island. And then at the end, they're allowed one book. And I've always known that my book would be the collective works of Dion Fortune. Because <laughs> you, when you were, when you didn't want to read any more fiction, then you would have the study of the Kabbalah. And when you couldn't, your brain couldn't take that, then you would have the common sense of uh, running the magical lodge. You know, it's just got everything for me. I think she's marvellous. <laughs> I love that. And I am familiar with Desert Island Discs, although you have to listen to it online here. But yeah. Um, and and have you ever chosen your favorite book? Oh, a favorite you know, book and a favorite luxury. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, my favorite book changes about every 10 years. So, yeah. right now, probably my favorite fiction book is uh, The Witches of New York by Amy McKay, who I'm oh, yes. hoping yeah. to get on the show. Um, I, and, um, I just, the, the way that she writes is so incredibly lyrical. Like it's, it's one of those things, like inspiring as a writer and then also just pure escapism to just fall into yeah. her writing. So I think that's it. Um, luxury. I would have to have coffee. Like, I don't know that I would function. Without it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the thing I would, if I, if I landed on a desert Island with no coffee, I'd find whatever plant had caffeine in it probably. So. Right. <laughs> A stimulating quality. Yeah. Have to find a plant with a stimulating quality. Yeah. So, Penny, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been such a lovely conversation and I hope that it finds people well when they listen to it and they um, enjoy it as much as I have. Well, oh, thank you. I've had an absolutely lovely time. You can tell from my enthusiasm how much I enjoy doing this. And I hope that the hints along the way, you know, I hope everyone's going to find a green shawl and go and speak to a tree now because yes. your life will change if you do. <laughs> me too. Thank you very much for having me. Witchlit is a production of Thousand Volt Press 
and is edited by Kaifel Agostini, who also designed our logo. Our music is Cosmic Glow by Andrew K. End, licensed from Pixabay. You can find transcripts and all our previous episodes at witchlitpod.com and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at witchlitpod. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow or subscribe and consider giving us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps other witches find the show. Thanks for listening and for reading Witchy. Witchy.